eating too much butter, eating too much peely nuts uh, is going to get you fat. And, and it's just not the case. What the heck is a peely nut? A peely nut is the world's healthiest nut. It's this exotic nut from Asia. Uh, highest fat, lowest carbohydrate, highest magnesium, um, full of copper, zinc, manganese. They're sustainably grown. They're wild grown. Uh, it's just this really interesting nut that uh, I discovered on a, on a kite surfing trip in the Philippines. Some people who have heard of peely nuts say, oh my gosh, that's that, that's that nut that's pure fat and uh, fat is bad for you. And yeah, I think peely nuts taste really good, but I can't, I can't have all that fat. Well, what say you? Well, so, you know, and that's, that's always been a, you'd be the expert on that, but uh, the keto dieters grabbed it because of that fat. The vegan people love it because of that high saturated fat that they, they, they may not get from, uh, or vegetarians for that matter, that it may not get from, from meat sources. Uh, so that fat, you could, you could expound on that, the, the saturated fat and the fats that are actually good for you. We've been told for a long time it's not, it's not, not good for you. Uh, so you're the expert on that, and you could tell more about that. But that the uh, people love that, and they also love the fact that they're so satiating. Uh, just a little bit of nuts, if you don't overdo it, will will satiate you, especially if you're if you're just trying, if you're doing a low carb diet. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, you know, you and Peely Nuts uh, appear. Uh, in, you know, a lot of the keto um, literature, a lot of the chat sites. And I actually, you know, mentioned Peely Nuts in, in all of my books as a, uh -huh. you know, as a, as a safe nut. Um, do, you ever, do you ever get pushback that uh, fat makes you fat and, yeah, I love your nuts, but I don't want to get fat? Absolutely. We get that all the time. And, uh, God, it's, it's just been, it's hard to, it's hard to break that. It's even ingrained in me, even though I have this company. It's just eating too much butter, eating too much peely nuts uh, is going to get you fat. And, and it's just not the case. Uh, it's the carbohydrates. It's the, well, as you know, it's, it's some of the other stuff that uh, the sugar that's going to get you fat. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a good point uh, that actually I, I have a patient um, this week that I saw who, um, has uh, insulin resistant, he's a pre-diabetic, he's quite a chunky fellow, and we've been, uh, and he has, he has insulin resistance, he has a very high insulin level, and it keeps going up and up. And I, we break down what he's eating, he says, oh, you know, I eat tons of nuts, I, I live on nuts. And I go, but, but wait a minute, uh, you know, nuts, whether you know it or not, actually certain nuts have a lot of carbohydrates. And so I actually kind of broke down for him how many carbohydrates he was eating in a day. And he yep. swore, I don't eat any sugars. I don't eat any starches. And, you know, you're wrong. And then I showed him, you know, how many carbohydrates he was getting in his nuts. And he was blown away. He said, geez, you know, I never even thought about that. Yeah, especially cashews, uh, some of the other nuts. Almonds, not so much, but so, quite a bit of carbs and almonds as well. Peanuts, which is not yeah. a nut, obviously. But, yeah, uh, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, well, I think that's what's unique about, you know, peely nuts is that they really virtually devoid of carbohydrates. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I, I always think about there's just not a lot of sources of saturated fat in the Philippines other than in the ocean. There's no prey. There's no animal prey there, really, to speak of. I guess there's the pigs that were brought over by the Spanish. But um, So it's a great coconuts, peely nuts are great sources of saturated fat. It's kind of how nature uh, created its, its saturated fat in the islands there. It's pretty neat when you think about it. Yeah, you know, I've, I've studied the uh, Catavans in uh, Papua New Guinea. And about 60% of their calories come from coconut. Um, yep. And that's where they, you know, and they're, they're actually some of the healthiest people in the world. And they, uh, they smoke like fiends, but they, but they have no coronary artery disease, never. Have, and they've had no strokes. 
And yet, you know, they're, they're eating, you know, this tremendous amount of saturated fat. And that they, you know, they ought to be clogging up their arteries right and left, but they don't. Yep. It's, it's, it's interesting. There actually are um, uh, a subspecies of peeling nuts in Papua New Guinea. Ah, it, well, there you yeah. go. And they eat them. Yep. Not a lot, but because they're difficult to harvest, but they do eat them. Now, one of the other things I like about peeling nuts is that they really have the highest magnesium of any nut. And I've written a lot about the fact that most Americans are really deficient in magnesium. Um, magnesium is, used, we used to get plenty of magnesium out of our soil, but our soil now is completely devoid of magnesium. And we would get that magnesium from the plants that we ate that got that magnesium from the soil. But magnesium is critical actually for, for bowel function. It's actually critical for heart and muscle function. It's also critical for sleep and it's critical for mood. And uh, when I was you know, operating on patients, we actually, th these people were so deficient in magnesium that we would have to give them IV magnesium four times a day for 48 hours to get their magnesium levels up to wow. support their heart function. So yeah. magnesium is really important. And, and so tell it, why, why do peeling nuts have such interesting, you know, magnesium and copper and zinc and manganese? That's a great question. You know, yeah, the magnesium thing is pretty interesting. I see a lot of people buying the supplement, they supplement magnesium. Uh, and I just tell them, like, eat some peeling nuts. You don't need to supplement, you know, and get it from actual food source. But uh, the reason is because they grow in this really rich region, region in the south of the Philippines. It's called the Bicol region. And uh, it's, a, it, it's in the ring of fire. There's active volcanoes. There's just a couple of volcanoes that went off. Matter of fact, this year and last year. So it's just really rich volcanic soil. That's untouched. I mean, it is unbelievable. You could throw any seed out in this soil and it'll grow. It's just so fertile, lots of rain, incredible soil. So like you were talking about, this is, these are wild grown. These are better than, these are better than organic. You know, we've, we have this, this, I've had this conversation with many people in stores and doing demos and are they organic? No, they're better. They're wild. No, I don't, I don't know. I only want them if they're organic. No, no, no. You don't understand. These are wild grown. They're picking them off the trees. And, uh, yeah, so it's that rich volcanic soil that just, you know, copper, manganese, phosphorus, zinc, uh, all kinds of good stuff. Now, you mentioned something when we were talking a minute ago. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about peeling nuts that I've had other people tell me is that they're, they're so satisfying that um, I've, I've challenged people to eat a stick of butter and you know go ahead let me let me see you do it and it's it's virtually impossible uh, because you you get satiated so quickly and is that why is that one of the reasons why it's really you know a great in a way weight loss food because of this satiation that happens so fast Absolutely. Yeah. So, the, it, you know, it sounds like a sales pitch, but you literally eat a handful and you get satiated and uh, you just you're just not hungry for a while. You know, it takes a little bit to digest them. It's fat. Uh, so your body's digesting it over. You know, it's not getting digested instantly like a like a carbohydrate. And it, it's taking some time and uh, it's great for people. The amazing thing about eating all that fat is you just and I think you could probably talk more about that. You just you're just not hungry all the time. You're just not hungry and they really are satiating. A lot of people ask, well, what and what's the difference between, in terms of nutritional differences, between sprouted, raw, and roasted? Yeah, so <clears throat> we sprout them, uh, we soak them, right? So it makes it easier for the body, body to digest. So we soak them, and then we cook them at a low temperature. Uh, raw, the raw peely nuts are great. The issue with raw peely nuts is that they have this skin on them. It's called a testa. And it's a, imagine a peanut with that skin on the outside, but imagine it almost uh, 10 times as thick and almost leathery. Um, so until you get that skin off and you look at the nut, you don't know whether the nut is bad. As a matter of fact, we, we, we actually lose 30% of the nuts to 
uh, bug bites or they're rotten underneath. Once we get that skin off, then we can see and we discard them, obviously. Uh, so if you're eating the raw ones and you're not checking every nut, you're probably, you know, three out of 10 nuts you're eating are not good for you. And uh, matter of fact, bad for your stomach, probably some bugs, who knows what's in there. Uh, so the raw ones, we don't, we, we sold them in the beginning. We just said, this is not, this is not safe. Uh, yeah, I've had them. Uh, I, long ago, I, I got them from you. And yeah, yeah. I, I didn't like the texture, and you're right, it was a lot of work. And yep. Yeah, they, they can be great if you, if you know they're they're very fresh, and you, you actually peel the skin off them, and you do it yourself. It's it's great, but uh, yeah. So then we, and then we do, uh, some of our nut butters have roasted, uh, have roasted nuts in them. But it's that sprouting um, that uh, makes it easier to digest. It's just much easier to digest, breaks down the toxins in the nut, so you don't just pass it through. You actually get some of the, the minerals from it. How would you describe the taste of peely nuts for someone who is, is there anything similar? Yeah. So it's, it's a mix between a macadamia nut. It's, it's softer than a macadamia, obviously higher fat, which people still can't wrap their head around. They're like, no, macadamia is highest. No, 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 peely nut is. And then, uh, so it's kind of a macadamia, pistachio, pine nut blend with a little softer texture than a macadamia. That's just my interpretation. I've heard other people say um, uh, they've thrown other nuts in there, a little bit of Brazil nut in there maybe. Uh, but it's a uh, very buttery, rich tasting, sort of melt in your mouth nut. It's very, it's fat. So yeah, it's... Yeah, it's it really, it, you're, you're right. It, it's almost... It's almost like you know eating eating butter. Uh, I think I think uh, pine nuts come closest, but it's much softer than even pine nuts. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a very very unique taste. You know what's interesting is we get a lot of people, uh, a lot of older people with bad teeth or dentures, or and they say no no I can't eat nuts, and no I'm and I, I tell them try it try it you I think you'll like it. And no, no, I just can't eat nuts. It's bad for my teeth, whatever. And they eat the peely nut, and they're like, "Oh my god, I can, I can finally eat a nut again." It's soft enough to where anybody can eat it. You know, that, you bring up a good point. Um, a lot of people have uh, diverticulosis or diverticulitis, and their doctors, to a person, say. I'm sorry, you know, you can you cannot eat nuts. Now, I do not tell my patients that, but I think you bring up a good point. Um, this doesn't act like any of the other nuts uh, in terms of these these things just basically dissolve. They do. Yep, exactly right. Yep. All right, I want to shift gears because you have such an interesting and diverse background. And I, I love these sort of stories, and so do my listeners. I mean, you've been a high-altitude mountain guide, an archaeologist assistant, a commercial fisherman, a kite surfing instructor, a glaciology field hand, and a climbing bum. So where and lots I, of other things. <laughs> and lots of other things. Yeah. Uh, so where in the, how in the world do you develop a passion for peely nuts? No. It's a crazy story. I, I, I'm just going to tell you this before I start with any of this is the word Pili in Tagalog, Filipino language, means chosen. So I always tell people the Pili nut chose me. I, I, it just happened. Uh, I, for a lot of years, you know, I, I grew up in Alaska. I grew up with the Native Americans in Alaska, uh, Eskimos in, in the north of Alaska. I was actually born up in the, in the, in the most northern town in, in North America. But uh, for years, I was climbing mountains, guiding. In college, I got into, into climbing mountains. In, in Alaska, obviously, there's a lot of great mountains. And I traveled all over the world guiding. I had an injury. I, I, I got, uh, I was in Los Angeles, dating a woman in Los Angeles. And I had a lot of energy. And I, I ended up uh, getting really into CrossFit when it was first coming out. And I got a case of rhabdo, correct me if I say this wrong, because I always do, uh, rhabdo my, myelosis. Yeah, Did I say my that right? Yeah. Yeah, my license. And uh, I was working. Matter of fact, a friend called me, said I need someone to guide some trips on Mount Rainier. I came up to Mount Rainier. And I had Rabdo and climbed the mountain with Rabdo guiding. Whoa. Yeah, I, it was a mess. I had seven days in the hospital. Long story short is I stopped guiding after at 37 years old, which was, um, which was uh, a blessing and a curse. I love the mountains. I miss all of it, but it changed my, my trajectory. I'm not a nine to five guy, so I ended up uh, 
uh, kite surfing. I was actually, you know, relaxing after being sick from rhabdo. It took me a while to get over that. My body was completely thrashed. And uh, I saw kite surfing for the first time. I tried it. I'd surfed. I, I used to work uh, in Hawaii. So I'd surfed in Hawaii quite a bit, but never kite surf. So I tried kite surfing. I didn't want to go back to a nine to five job. I was done with the guiding, I ended up teaching kite surfing. I went to Brazil, I went to the Caribbean, Mexico, everywhere. Uh, long story short, I ended up in the north of the Philippines and that's where I tried the peeling nut for the first time. And obviously yeah, people say, I, I didn't discover the peeling nut. People have been eating it for thousands and thousands of years. I was just one of the guys to bring it back to the West and, and share it. I Googled it. I couldn't believe that, uh, that uh, nobody was, nobody had heard of it in the U.S., essentially. I mean, there was just nobody selling it. And there was one uh, company of two American guys. They're kind of the pioneer guys. They're Americans that lived in um, Macau that were selling it over there. But in the United States, nobody was really selling it. Um, and that's really how I fell into it. So my friends, after I ate it, said, you got to go to Beacol. This is where these nuts are from. So I went to the region. I met some people. And I literally snuck them back in my backpack uh, through customs, went to a store in Los Angeles. I was on Shark Tank. I told this story. Uh, went to a store in Los Angeles. It's called Erewhon. It's a very popular store, very hip store in L.A. And I walked in and said, uh, uh, would you guys want to sell these? I had put a bag with a sticker on it. It said Peely Nuts. And yeah, sure. It, you know, so they bought a case of them from me. I didn't even know how much to, to charge for them. I just said, ah, this much. Okay, sure, we'll take them. A week later, we'll take two cases. Two weeks later, we'll take four cases. And that's literally how the, the business started. I had no, no business background. You know, uh, all my other things were great, but they definitely weren't getting me ready for business. So, uh, all right, so what are, what were peeling nuts used for in the, in the Philippines? Yeah, great question. So the, the Philippines, they actually, uh, sugar, they're kind of a, a treat. So... If you go, if you're traveling in the Philippines, you go to a place called a Pasalubong, which is like a, uh, a store of gifts. So if you travel to Vermont, you grab some uh, maple syrup and you bring it back. So if you, tr if you travel to the Bicol region in the Philippines, it's tradition that you bring back peely nuts for your family. And the peely nut is, they basically deep fry it and sugarcoat it. They use like caro syrup. All right. <laughs> so, and it's amazing, but it's definitely not healthy. So I, we put a different twist on it, and that's how we ended up. Like, we don't need to do this. We don't need to sugarcoat them. These are an amazing product in their, in their cell. Uh, so we did uh, an uh, unadulterated version of it. We sprouted it and then uh, cooked it. You know, actually, the coconut oil is my – the coconut oil Himalayan salt is my – is sort of my famous product that everybody knows and it's the bestseller. And and uh, that was made by mistake. Uh, when I first started the company, I, I, it was a big deal. I bought 5,000 bags. It was a big deal for me at the time. It cost me, I can't remember what it cost, but it was a big deal, like a big step. I'm going to buy some printed bags. And on those printed bags, it said coconut oil. Now, they were deep fried in coconut oil, refined coconut oil, not extra virgin. Um, and if you know refined coconut oil, it's, it's not healthy either, right? It's, if you've ever seen right. Copra. Uh, they bleach it. They put all kinds of chemicals. I said, we don't need to do this, but I'd already printed the bags. So I said, wait a minute. So we started adding co extra virgin organic coconut oil to it. And for some reason, adding that oil to the peeling nut just brought out this amazing, made it even more buttery, amazing flavor. And that's sort of how the whole peeling nut craze started, really. It was by mistake. I just had it on the bag, so I figured I'd better throw it in there. And it came out amazing. Yeah. No. So, so you were kind of forced to use the the good stuff, huh? Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, was was this episode of rhabdomyolitis um, was that a, a turning point for you in health, or have you always been in, interested in health? No, you know that was a huge, huge, huge turning point for me. I was I was feeling pretty bad. Um, after the, the stint in the hospital, they had been in an IV for six or seven days. And I, I honestly, I bullied the doctor into letting me leave. And uh, I can get out of here. I'm fine, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, man, your, your numbers are still very high. CPK, I believe it was. And uh, yeah. I just kept aggressively, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I should, probably should have stayed a few more days because they were still quite high looking back at it. And uh, 
No, and I was pretty laid up. So that kind of set me on a journey of health, of trying to heal myself. I was weak. Doc, I went to the doctor. They told me, yeah, you should be fine by now. Maybe you have chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, all these things. I was, I was having uh, fainting spells, very weird stuff. Um, uh, a little bit of pots. I think that's, you yeah. know, that yeah. is all kinds of weird stuff. And I don't know if it was damage to my kidney. I have no idea what caused it, but, uh, or I got an infection in the hospital. I have no idea, but it took me a year to feel good again. And along in that year, I spent a lot of time at natural food stores, time on the internet. Uh, I learned about fasting. Fasting saved my life, to be honest with you. That, that was what really put me back into, like reset my body. Um, I don't know if you're a big proponent of fasting or not, but it was, oh, it was yeah. yeah, it was incredible. I did a, I did a 12 day, uh, my first fast I ever did, I was reading an article, have you ever gone 24 hours without food? And I was like, you know, I, I don't really, maybe one of my climbing trips or something, I'm not sure I've ever really gone without food. My 24-hour stint, I'm kind of an extremist, went to 12 days, and I felt incredible. I couldn't believe it. After five days, I was, I just felt great. Uh, my, I, I've never been so clear. My mind's never been so clear. Uh, so the fasting really helped me. So that was part of it. And then the period that when I first tried it, I had no idea of the, uh, the breakdown of how keto, how fatty it was. And then, you know, back in 2015, we just started getting deep into keto. Um, so I start, I got into keto as well. I haven't been doing it lately. I, I had a bad case of, um, of COVID. Unfortunately, it kind of kicked me out of a bunch of stuff, but yeah, yeah. That's what started me on the journey really was the rabdo. So how did you, how did you connect the keto community with, with peely nuts? Was that by accident or is that you said, Hey, this is, this might work for these guys. No, it was, I'll be honest with you. It was, it, you know, I, it, that was more paleo. And I went to a show called paleo FX, which was this great show. I presented there. Yeah. It's a great show. And it, it's kind of dwindled now and it's not doing so good, but yeah, uh, for various reasons, I don't know, but COVID. the, yeah, COVID, and there's a bunch of political, weird political stuff. But uh, uh, it was a great show. I went there, and I met some guys, uh, and some of the early keto guys, like Jimmy Moore. I was on his podcast, some of these early keto guys. And, and they're like, this nut is amazing. And we just took it from there. So, I mean, we've been doing the keto. Basically, the keto crowd uh, jumped, you know, loved what we were doing and has supported me since, really, since 2015, 2014. They jumped on it, and it's been a big part of our business. So peely nuts are are really hard to acquire. I mean, they're they're hard to harvest. Why did this get started in the first place? I guess is a, is the first question. I mean, started for me or started for them? For I guess them. You know. For them. Yeah, the, I think it goes back to that. Uh, it's a really it's a, it, this this product is so cool. Uh, yeah, it's incredibly difficult. So they climb up. These guys, you know, and I've seen sixty year old guys. That are in some of the videos on my webpage and, and YouTube. It, these guys, some of these guys are sixty years old. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, they climb up hundred feet off in these trees, and I'm, I, I used to climb. And I'm like, oh, I, I would never do what they're Don't doing. Don't do that. It, eh? Yeah, it's incredible. They're walking across limbs. They're pulling down, and you get one fruit has the nut in it. So on the outside of the fruit is this. Uh, it almost looks like a small avocado. It's pretty neat. You, you look it up. You can take. A, you see what it's like. It looks like a small avocado. That outside flesh of that fruit is uh, is actually edible, and it's very good. It's very earthy. It's all. It also can be turned into oil, which we're working on right now. Which is a, it's got a very similar profile to uh, olive oil. And once you get that that fruit off, then you have this hard shell nut. They actually chop that nut by hand with a machete. They've tried to create machines, but the machine ends up breaking the nut making it hard to get it out. So these guys, they actually have competitions in, in the region who can chop the fastest, and they can do many, many, many kilos in a day. It's very incredible to watch, but it's all done by hand. Then when you get the nut <clears throat> out of the shell, you've got that testa, which I was talking about before, which is the skin. That has to be soaked off. We sprout it. We still can take it off, and then we dehydrate it. Then we bag it up, and then we ship it across uh, to the States. Yeah, it's too much work. It's incredible. It's an incredible amount of work. And that's why they are a little bit more expensive. And I, I, I tell people, um, we don't really want to see it. Sure, we'd love to see it cheaper so more people can eat it. But on the other hand, 
we want to keep the people working and and it's the philippines the wage is not the same in the u.s and we want to create jobs and uh um so anyway it's a lot of work we don't want to lower the price too much we want to make sure that everybody gets a fair wage along along the supply chain and that's what happens with a lot of these places is the farmer ends up getting very little uh, you know, and the, the big stores are making all the money, and the middlemen are making all the money, and, and the farmers not getting a lot. And we're trying to uh, make sure they get a fair wage. But it is. It's incredibly difficult. And I don't recommend anybody touches this product. It's just too difficult. There's so many little steps along the way. If you mess up, the product doesn't come out good. Uh, it's a very difficult product. And, I mean, these trees are in the wild, right? I mean, you, know, you don't have a plantation Great question. Yeah, they're trying to, and, I, and that's another thing. I've got some more videos you can check out about that. But yeah, they're 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 wild, and and I'll be honest with you, the Philippines is laden in the rice fields and some of the other regions. They're spraying the hell out of it, unfortunately, with pesticides. And I'm pretty anti-pesticide. I like organic, wild. Um, so I did a bunch of research on it, and the peely trees are basically above. Uh, any of that spraying activity. So they're typically on the edge of the mountainsides. So any of the rice fields and all that stuff is below. So all the stuff, if there is any pesticides or any of that stuff, it's being washed down. But yeah, they're growing wild. They're trying to, matter of fact, I was just at a, six months ago or so, I was at a, a, a place where they're grafting the trees and they're, they're trying to make sort of plantation style, more plantation style. But it crops really well with other stuff. So you can, plant other stuff near it and it seems to do really well and you can't grow it like uh, uh, like an almond it needs a, a male pollinator so it's the, no it's nothing what you they brought me to a region that they called like a monocrop farm and it's like the forest it's not the same as what you could imagine uh, you know driving through central California right it's yeah no it's it's jungle it's pretty interesting and there's a lot of trees that are untapped that are just out in the forest that nobody's gathering just falls to the forest floor and nobody's gathering. But the more interest that we're creating with it and the more that they can make money by gathering them, they'll, they'll go get them. So I take it that what, you know, one of the things that drives you is this is, sustains a local culture, sustains a community. And you're not, you're not plowing down fields to plant palm trees for palm oil and destroying yeah, the jungle. Plow. Yeah, no, it's not my style. People ask me that all the time. Is it is it harming? No, we're actually not at all. We don't harm anything. Uh, a lot of the fruit, I, I, I walk through the forest and you can see the little peely sprouty. So each one of these fruits is a is a peely seedling ready to grow, essentially, right? So it falls to the ground. That uh, that outer shell, that outer fruit is full of all kinds of nutrients and minerals that feed. It it decays, turns into soil, and it feeds that little plant. It's really interesting. Uh, no, we're not. That's not my style at all. We're trying to actually do the opposite of that. We're trying to make it um, as sustainable as, as possible. The product itself is incredibly sustainable. So that, that outer uh, fruit is edible. Uh, back in the day, they were feeding it to pigs, but we're trying to find better, better uses for it now. The shell is used for cooking fuel. So they take the shell and they actually cook fuel with it. And if they can't use it for cooking fuel, they'll sell it for personal cooking fuel. They actually sell it to coconut facilities and they'll use it to heat up whatever they're using in the process of making coconut. They'll, they'll use the, the, the shells. Uh, and then we obviously are eating the nut. So it's a really, really cool, neat product. Similar to coconut, where you can pretty much use everything. Why do you, th why do you think um, Americans never heard of this nut? Uh, is it just, was it all just locally consumed there and there wasn't any yeah. for export? Or, and then pretty you much. happened along? Pretty much. They were just eating it. You know, China, some of these other countries have known about it and eaten it for quite some time, but uh, pretty much. And then also, it's a difficult, it's a very difficult product. It's got to be done right. And then it was only that one, they only just sugarcoated it. That's all they did with it. And so maybe that's why, but I get people that, uh, Filipino Americans or Filipinos that write me all the time, like, what? I've been thinking about this for years. Why didn't I do this? You know, I don't know why. I really don't know why, because a lot of American soldiers were over there. I'm not, sh I'm not sure why it was never brought back and introduced to the U.S. How did you go from, you know, selling these out of the back of a truck or walking into a grocery store, and, and now you're a, a multi-million dollar company, right? Yeah, it just kind of happened. It went from, 
you know, I never took any money. I never did any of that. It just kind of went from a hundred dollars to 200, you know, that first initial to 500 to a thousand to, you know, we were buying, you know, a hundred pounds to 200 pounds to thousand pounds to multiple tons to, you know, and so it just kind of happened. Uh, I had no idea what I had. I didn't know people that were going to be that excited about it. And it, it just kind of took off. Um, and we could have probably been a, a lot bigger. Uh, you know, we turned down a lot of like whole foods contracts and in the beginning, we just weren't ready for that stuff. The supply chain was not there. The processing facilities were not there. Uh, they're very mom and pop. And now we we built them up quite a bit and we can do, you know, a lot bigger numbers, but it's definitely never going to be <clears throat> uh, like an almond, right? I could put a phone call in right now and have 50 tons of almonds sitting here next week. It's not the same with peeling nuts. It's just, a, it just, it's a lot of effort and, and, and it's a small harvest as well on a relative basis compared to some of the other nuts in the world. It's, just, it's a very small harvest. Are pilly nuts from year to year uh, about the same availability? Or, for instance, we hear about, oh, this was a bad year for macadamia nuts, or this is a horrible year for almonds. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it's up and down for sure. And that's another reason. You know, a lot of big corporations have looked at the peely nut, and if they don't see you know, a quarter billion dollars in revenue there, they just don't even bother, right? They just want to see the big, huge numbers. And it's just not there. It's a small, small crop on a relative basis. But yeah, it goes up and down. There's great seasons, and then there's uh, there's not so great seasons. And a lot of it has to do with the climate there. That particular region gets hammered by typhoons regularly. And uh, they, they say that a, a very big typhoon when it, it comes and knocks all the fruit out of the tree, the next season will be a good season. So, yeah, they call it typhoon tree, actually. And it's one of the trees that they promote to plant for typhoon resistance. It does really well in these storms. That's something, I didn't mean to cut you off there. There's something I want to talk about as well. These are naturally pollinated. Uh, it's not like almonds in, 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 in the Central Valley where they're trucking in bees from Florida. I was just thinking about the hurricane in Florida that devastated the bee population. So there's some issues right now with the almond industry. Uh, this is naturally pollinated by bees in the jungle, by birds, which is pretty interesting. They have a local like toucan-esque bird that that uh, called the kala that flies around there that actually will eat the eat the fruit and and drop it and they spread it all over the region. It's pretty interesting. Now you don't just uh, have the kind of typical salted peeling nut. You're you're much more diverse than that. What what else do you do? Yeah, I do too many things, honestly. I yeah, I meet people. We, speaking of that, we sell this uh, the world's most healthy honey, which is a stingless bee honey from the Philippines that is actually a pollinator is one of the pollinators of the peely tree. We call it peely wat honey. Uh, the local name is Kiwat. Uh, in order so so people wouldn't just copy what we're doing, we called it peely wat, and they're actually pollinating the peely trees. And they're this sting, they look like an ant, but they create this honey, this fermented honey. I don't know if you've ever had it. I'll send you some if you haven't. But no, I haven't. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's got about uh, 40% more water than, than your traditional honey. So it actually ferments a little bit. It's got a sweet, sour taste. It's uh, almost like a kombucha-esque honey. I don't know how to describe it. It's not something that you would, could eat like a regular honey, but it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so we do, we sell that, we sell hot sauce and then we sell, the, I sell the world's best hot sauce. It's just amazing hot sauce from the Philippines. Uh, it's called Buyo. It's made from the, uh, Saling Labuyo, which was once thought to be the hottest pepper in the world. Um, it's a local Filipino chili and, uh, that is literally, I don't have time to really push it too hard, but it's the best hot sauce on the planet. Um, and it's fermented, right? It's fermented as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and, and folks, remember that fermentation uh, breaks down the lectins that are in peppers. And, you know, all traditional cultures have always, you know, learned to ferment their peppers uh, to break down the harmful particles or to peel and de-seed peppers, which is another method. But, huh, interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah ferment them. Huh, cool, very cool. Yeah, and then we saw, obviously, too many flavors of peeling nuts, but they're great. Every one of them is really good. So we have a bunch of different flavors of Peely Nuts, coconut oil, pink Himalayan salt. We actually have a curry flavor that's amazing. Um, yeah, we even made a, a, a Pinoy style one 
uh, that has a little bit of sugar in it. It's the only one. The rest of ours are, are keto. Uh, we've just got a bunch of different flavors. And you got peeling nut butter too, right? We do. I have too many skews, but <laughs> yes, I have peeling nut butter. People just keep at, whenever I I'm like, ah, oh, we're going to stop selling that. It's too much effort. People write me like, please, please keep selling and we love this so we do sell peeling nut butter as well yep so do you have any cool ways to use peely nuts in recipes that you can share with our audience rather than just have a handful yeah i like to if you're if you're a meat eater i like to crust meats with them uh, if you're if you're uh uh into pasta it doesn't have to be it can be a gluten-free pasta um uh, uh you can make like a pesto out of them which is great Snack on them, obviously. You can, a lot of people I see been using them for like charcuterie boards lately as they're little, they put the, the peely nuts on there. And it's kind of a cool, I, one thing about the peely nut that's very cool is that people uh, love to introduce new things to people. So you walk out and you say, you know, people go, what the heck are those? It's like, oh, it's a peely nut. You've never heard of this? And I, people just love to introduce things. But um, uh, there's all kinds of stuff. You can put them in shakes. We have people that make pizza crusts and bagels out of them. And these are people uh, that are in deep ketosis for for medicinal for for medical reasons, right? Uh, and uh, uh, brain cancer survivors typically who see them use. I, I give, and, and that's something I just like throw out there. I always give a deal to people if they've got a serious health problem. I'm always happy to, to hook them up and let give them some and let them try them. And but yeah, big. I, I've seen everything: pizza crust, bagels. Um, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. I like to just take the nuts and maybe warm them up on a, a skillet a little bit and eat them warm they just seem to be to be really good like that it brings out the oils and yeah they taste great folks uh you really you got to try these i'm a big fan of them they're unique they're there's nothing like them quite frankly and uh if you're into keto like you know the last book unlocking the keto code this should be a part of your program so Big fan. And Jason, uh, keep up the good work. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Make sure to check out the next one here. Most Americans are insulin resistant, metabolically inflexible, and as much as you would think you could burn fat for fuel instead of sugar, quite frankly, you can't.